I want to take this moment to announce that our holiday sale has officially begun. If you go on Amazon and look for our book, Read This Before Medical School, it is now available for a significantly discounted price. This will only be available for the next couple of weeks, so do get your copy while you can. Don't think this is the right book for you? Do check out our mini-series on the Medical Nemesis podcast, which depicts each part of the book, and go to freemeded.org slash medstudent to download your free Essentials of PDF. Don't forget the holidays are coming up, and this could make a great stocking stuffer for friends, family, or anyone interested in medicine and healthcare. For more details, you can still go to freemeded.org slash medstudent or search for Read This Before Medical School on Amazon. Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. Dr. Cindy Duke holds a PhD in microbiology and immunology and is a board-certified OBGYN with a specialization in reproductive endocrinology. She's also the medical and laboratory director for the Nevada Infertility Clinic and has 10 years of clinical education experience. Cindy, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you. Sorry we had so much uh, trouble getting this going, but I'm glad to have you on. And uh, especially with your specialization here is going to be very unique. Not a lot of students have a lot of experience in this. And I think your insights will be invaluable. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I'm looking forward to it. Me too. So I like to start off with an icebreaker question. And that is, what is either the funniest or scariest thing that you've ever seen in a hospital clinical setting? Well, I would say, oh my gosh, they're just an abundance of funny things to see, particularly as an OBGYN resident and uh, attending. I think it was, <laughs> we were called the on-call resident for Halloween and a couple came in in labor and the nurses said, oh, you have got to come see this. So we walked into the room and our pregnant patient who was in labor, she had on an outfit she was dressed as an oven and her husband was dressed as a baker. And so he had put a bun in the oven. <laughs> that was pretty funny. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a ironic and hilarious story. <laughs> so it's like the, uh, the epitome of, I don't know, like a dad joke right there. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was pretty funny. You know, as she was laboring, the oven just kept more disheveled and parts of the oven were falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> And then we had to sit the baker down when it was time for delivery. So what do you see as your role in education in your profession, specifically in reproductive endocrinology and infertility? I serve as a professor and educator on multiple levels. So in the context of my clinic, I am an educator and preceptor for students residents, but we also have medical assistants and nursing students who come through. And then in the academic setting at the university level, do lectures for the medical students, precepting them through their problem-based learning. So we facilitate their learning cases when they're doing hypothetical cases. So I do lectures, we do uh, hypothetical cases for them. And then in the office, doing actual clinical exposure to the field of reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Great. So you deal with medical students and nursing students and MAs and pretty much everything at uh, the clinic, but also with medical students at the hospitals, what I gather. Correct. Yes. All right. So a wide variety of uh, clinical experience there for a wide variety of students. And it's really exciting. Um, We also have some PhD students who for the laboratory. Uh, so those who have all trainees who are interested in biology and the lab science of uh, fertility methods. Ah, that's very unique. I don't think that has been an answer for any of the uh, past interviews. Yes, no, that's something that makes us unique too. So in your field, what do you feel makes like a great preceptor? What are some things to look forward to that can really help get the point across to students? 
I think the first is a preceptor who's actually open to the idea of I mean, students. I think that is really important because if you're working with someone who is excited to have you there, the uh, back and forth in terms of the gain of information and the being receptive to questions doesn't happen. So from my personal experience as a student and now a teacher, I would say that that's one of the biggest and most important things. You know, some people are preceptors because they're told by their department, their boss, you have to precept. And so that's really important, I would say first and foremost. Um, other things that are really important is making sure your preceptor has the time to actually have some sit down time with you during each session, even if it's 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the day to summarize what you saw that day and to really make sure that you have a clear understanding of what you saw and what you learned. And of course, the way to know if you had a good understanding is allowing you to ask questions in a safe space where you don't feel judged um, negatively for asking questions. And that seems to be something that we've been lucky with a lot of the interviews so far is most of them have some sort of clinic or or independent away from the hospital setting, or they're independent within the hospital. So they are doing it because they really love to do it, not because they're being told to do it. So that's a, a great point to bring across. It's really important. I mean, having been a student myself, you could tell the difference between a preceptor who wants to teach, who has the time to teach, because some people want to teach, but they're so overextended that they can't really dedicate that time to the trainee or student who's there with them. But when someone has both perfectly, absolutely. And so, yes, going to the clinic, even if you're in an academic setting, if you're working with someone who does have office time, if they're telling you maybe you should come to my office, if that's a possibility, it's good to go because they oftentimes, you know, they have just a little bit more time to teach in that setting. That's a great point. And I'm kind of curious what your thoughts might be on this because I hear some people say on the opposite side that, well, in the clinic, we're not going to have the variety of experiences that we could in the hospital. But I'm not sure if that would apply, especially to some sort of specialization such as yours. Correct. I think the specialty matters because in my case, as an OBGYN, if someone's interested in acute obstetrics, then yes, in the hospital, you'll see so much more variety. But in the realm of gynecology and certainly in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, which is primarily office-based, then coming to the office, you see a whole lot more. The staff is more relaxed. The physician is usually more relaxed. And the patients are usually more open to the idea of a student participating and being involved. Whereas obstetrics on the inpatient setting, it's just so much high stakes, uh, things can change so quickly that while there is a wealth of opportunity for learning in that setting too, because I've certainly taught in that setting and there are lots of opportunities there as well, you definitely have more guaranteed consistent opportunities in the office for GYN and reproductive endocrine infertility. And you mentioned with high stakes, what are some things that maybe a preceptor in this kind of scenario in this environment, in this academic setting, need to be aware of or could potentially make a mistake in? Well, you know, I think one of the things is assuming independence in the trainee. And so it's really important that you actually orient the trainee, the medical student, the nursing student, orient them as to what they can and cannot do on that rotation, and then facilitating the opportunities for the things they can do. And, you know, so there's that. Another is introducing the trainee to a patient. So as you can imagine, particularly in the field of obstetrics in the inpatient setting, uh, it's, it really helps for the patient to understand that this physician works with a medical student. This medical student is working with, in my case, Dr. Cindy. And I have Chase working with me today. Chase is this. So by introducing Chase, now they're more welcoming of having you participate and witness this very personal time in their lives. And then when it comes to sort of the reproductive endocrinology part, the infertility part, that's not a normal, the average part of an OBGYN rotation for most students. What can you say about that in specific that students might be 
interested or, or need to be aware of if they were going to start a rotation? Absolutely. Well, I would tell you, everybody should be interested, but I'm biased. <laughs> I would say, you know, for example, I can speak of my own personal experience. So I got interested, I became interested in reproductive endocrine and infertility as a medical student on my OBGYN outpatient clerkship during my MD PhD program. And it was serendipity really, because I was supposed to work with a resident at the resident OB guide clinic, but the resident had a medical uh, emergency that came up personal reason. And so I was reassigned. And certainly what I liked about the clinic setting was in the field of reproductive endocrine and infertility, you see a little of everything. And so we still do obstetrics, but we generally do obstetrics in the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. So you see early pregnancy, you see uh, different flavors of things that can go well and that can go wrong in early pregnancy. You also get to work with men and women. So in a typical OBGYN rotation, you're only meeting female patients for the most part. In the reproductive endocrine and infertility clinic, you also meet male meet male patients. And so that's one unique difference from the general ob clerkship and rotation. The other is you get to really discover all the different aspects of the world of reproductive medicine. So not only do we help people achieve pregnancy, but we help women freeze eggs. We help men freeze sperm. We even work with patients who are transgender and uh, approaching the time for gender reassignment. Uh, We work with pediatric patients. So patients who either have puberty that started too early or patients who've never had puberty despite getting to age 16, 17. Uh, We work, we are also surgeons, so we operate. So you actually get to spend time in the surgical suite with us as well. Well, that's a wide span of different scenarios. And a lot of those topics, especially when it comes to, for instance, even male infertility, are really only scratched upon in med school. It's just not something that the average doctor is going to have to run across very often. So getting those really unique experiences through your clinic sounds like a great opportunity for any student lucky enough to rotate with you. It really is. It's an amazing opportunity. One that you sometimes don't even realize will come in handy later. So one of the things that I found remarkable is I've had students rotate with me who've then gone on to become, say, radiation oncologists or those who've gone on to do pathology. And um, I even had one who went on to do psychiatry. And what's interesting about my field in particular, my subspecialty, is it actually overarches with a lot of things that you will encounter, even if you don't believe your specialty is directly connected to mine. And so, for example, if you're someone going into cancer oncology, you're probably at some point going to encounter someone who is young enough that they, while they're treating their cancers, still need to consider preserving their fertility or their chances of becoming a parent or growing their family. If you're someone who's a radiation oncologist, your radiation treatments may impact someone's future fertility or current fertility. If you're a gastrointestinal doctor, similarly, you may come across someone whose fertility is potentially threatened. And so, you know, if I started listing all the specialties I have worked with, over the course of the past three years, for example, I think I will touch on everyone from nuclear medicine to neurosurgery to radiology to neurology, and then all of the subspecialties, rheumatology, for example. We do quite a bit of work with rheumatologists and nephrologists, the kidney doctors, because again, many of the treatments that they may have to consider for their patients could directly impact the patient's chances for future childbearing, or in the case of a guy, his ability to cause a pregnancy. Yeah, it sounds like you really do touch on every other specialty out there in a very unique way. (laughs) It's very unique because oftentimes it's not even something that's first consideration. And so uh, one of the things I do a lot of in working to raise awareness is getting out there to let other specialties know what services we provide and how I can work with them to make their patients' goals 
a reality. And certainly in the context of patients who have very morbid disease conditions, we know that offering someone the opportunity or the hope of future childbearing is a sign to them, at least, that their prognosis, there's a chance of survival and that they can go on to have children. That really speaks in a way that motivates them for continuing their treatment. I see. And I'm really glad that we can help uh, with raising awareness for this as a clinical rotation, but also as a specialty, the more the students learn about this stuff early on, uh, the more they'll know what to expect later on in their careers. Yes. Absolutely. And who to reach out to, even if you didn't go into this subspecialty, to know that we exist and we can help and we like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're teaching students in your clinic or hospital either setting, uh, do you use something similar to the one minute preceptor model as far as the basic outline of how you teach? I do. So one of the things that I like to do in particular when I have my students sh show up is we go through that model maybe with some modifications, but essentially, yes. So I make sure I understand what they're looking to learn, what I'd like them to learn, identify potential hurdles before we even start, and also identify for them what will be key things to take away from the rotation. Exactly. Those are pretty much the same types of things I've been hearing from a lot of physicians is, you know, the basic outline is there. Everyone just implements it in their own way. And especially when you're dealing with so many different types of students from MD to LPN to PhD, MA, really have to mold it to the scenario. We do. And, you know, for example, if I have a medical student, my goal is to show them as much as possible. I, it's also my goal whenever possible to show them the zebras, <laughs> um, the things that you very often only read about in the textbooks but have never seen in reality. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for me to grab my nurses and say, go find X or Y medical student. If they're there, they have to see this. They need to see this. Because some things are so much more infrequent in terms of when you see them. Yet it's something that a, a medical student needs to see because nothing, in my opinion, solidifies a learning experience than having actually seen it in person. I couldn't agree more. Read about it all you want, but until you actually see a patient with it and follow them along the, you know, their treatment and regimen, then that's when it really sticks. It really sticks because you finally have someone to associate everything you've read about with. Precisely. So when you have students rotating with you, are there any things that they should know ahead of time as far as what your expectations might be or any preparation that they can do ahead of time? Well, I usually say know the menstrual cycle. <laughs> so the truth is a lot of what we do in the world of reproductive endocrine and infertility centers around some aspect of the menstrual cycle. And so it's really about understanding the physiology of the menstrual cycle, what is the basics of it, so that when we start encountering all the different ways that it can go wrong, or all the different ways in which we may manipulate it, depending on the situation, it makes sense if you know what's the basic normal. So I definitely encourage knowing the physiology of the menstrual cycle. And I encourage that for any OBGYN rotation, even the GYN oncology rotation. I also would say that for me as a preceptor, I like my students to come in with at least three things that they'd like to see. They could be outlandish, that's okay, but I will ask you that. I'll ask what are the three top things you hope to see or accomplish on this rotation? And I'm not asking that because I want to be difficult. I'm asking that so that I can also be on the lookout to help you achieve that goal. I think part of engendering love for a specialty and love for different aspects of medicine is seeing that there's buy-in. I know for myself as a student, that was one of the things that I thought made it hard for me as a student, which is I liked everything. Of course, when you like things, your preceptors see that. And so they also get excited that you like what they are doing. And part of that was showing up with things I definitely wanted to be able to see on each rotation. I love it. That's the first one. Have three things that you want to see on the rotation. That's a great thing to really make you understand you know, what's coming and prepare for it and pick a couple of important topics or interesting topics. And yeah, I haven't really heard that one before. I like it. No, have three things. I mean, they don't even have to be mind boggling. 
you know, for example, if you're coming to a clinic like mine, which actually has an active laboratory on site, even if you know you're not interested in OBGYN or REI, but perhaps you'd like to see what a human egg looks like, <laughs> you know, that, that just lets people know, oh, we should make sure he gets to see a human egg. Things like that really make a difference, but it also gets you enthusiastic about your rotation and it gives you something to always be goal-directed about. That's a great point. Having that buy-in too is something that I hear a lot and uh, might not be really instilled in a lot of students early on or might bite them later on. So if they don't have that going in, they're not going to be interested in the rotation. Although I kind of feel like with yours being, you know, such a, an interesting and unique specialty, if you get lucky enough to have a rotation that that's unique, you better have some interest in it. Yes. No, the, I think it's so hard not to find someone who's who is interested because yes, as you're saying, it tends to be an elective rotation. I know some people, though, they select elective rotations because they're thinking, well, it's office space, I can show up, but they're going to be busy, and so I'll just have time to myself. I would say that as a preceptor, I actively look for opportunities to include students. And my nurses are the same way because my nurses are also active preceptors for nursing students. They're preceptors for medical assistant students, um, preceptors for nurse practitioner students. So. They all know that any opportunity to learn should be made available to the student. And so, yes, no, the converse to what should you know when you show up is if you don't feel like you have any interest and you'd be completely just disinterested and unenthusiastic about the whole process, it's probably not the rotation for you. Yeah, probably right. And same with the preceptors, I guess, in that manner, if they're not actively seeking out ways to engage the students, maybe you shouldn't be taking on that many students? I agree. No, I mean, again, you know, I've seen it. I've seen both sides of it, you know, and I can tell you that having been a student myself, and I loved medical school, I loved my rotations. I would tell you the people that I distinctly remember the most, even to this day, are the ones in terms of preceptors who were enthusiastic. The ones who were like, oh, where's Cindy? She's got to see this. Oh, Cindy, you've got to hear this story, you know? Um, and the, they haven't left me. They are the ones who I try to pattern myself as since because they really did so that, you know, I see patients in my clinic and I still remember my neurology pearls and how to apply them because it was such an exciting rotation for me. Um, albeit in neurology, we, we diagnose things. We didn't treat as many things. <laughs> That's a dig that not intentional. I loved neurology. Yeah. And I can definitely see how that interest and that engagement on both sides really, really makes a big difference in the clinical settings. So are there any ways to really excel in a rotation with you or anything that a student might want to do in preparation for asking for a letter of recommendation? Well, I, oh, I'm always a fan of giving letters of recommendation. And I'm also very honest. I think the most honest thing that a preceptor can do if they really don't think that they can write you an enthusiastic letter of recommendation is to tell you that. On the other hand, I haven't had to tell anyone that. <laughs> But I do think it's important for you, the student who's requesting a letter of recommendation, to be assertive enough, not aggressive. Notice I'm saying assertive, but not aggressive. And asking, would you be willing to write me an enthusiastic letter of recommendation? A lot of students are very scared to ask for letters. And I can see why. You're not sure how they're going to respond. But the truth is, if you've demonstrated enthusiasm, you've worked well with your preceptor, your preceptors told you they're enthusiastic about you, you should feel comfortable asking for an enthusiastic letter. And I say the word enthusiastic because I feel strongly that you need to put that word in there. Because if you just said, I need a letter of recommendation, but you weren't clear in what type of letter you're looking for, then you may well end up with a letter that's lackluster and not really supportive. And while it's the preceptor's fault for writing that, you might have avoided such a letter if you just asked upfront for the type of letter you wanted. And if they're not comfortable, they tell you, no, I'm not comfortable, and you move on. Don't take the letter. 
That's a great point. I suppose a lot of students do what I did do my basic sciences and read a lot of forums. And sometimes you get a lot of misleading information about maybe not asking for a letter of recommendation here or having to you know, suck up a little bit to get a good one written. And a lot of this information that seems to be misinformation based on all the interviews I've done so far. I agree. No, as someone who had stellar letters of recommendations, I would tell you how I did it. Um, I actually, <laughs> I shared my emails with my classmates and particularly the students who came after me because I had very specific ways of asking for letters of recommendation. And so for me, when you're requesting a letter of recommendation, my advice to students is it's almost a pitch, right? So it's not just going up and saying, hi, Dr. Duke, can you write me a letter? And you say it in a very, um, you know, sad way. No, it's Dr. Duke. I really enjoyed working with you. And here are the things that I liked about my rotation with you. I am hoping you felt the same way about me. Would you be willing to write me a le an enthusiastic letter of recommendation, letter of support? You don't have to lie to them either. Don't tell them you're going into their specialty. Don't do that. Just tell them the truth. I, for example, I can remember one in particular, my neonatology, my pediatrics rotation. I at no point told anyone that I was doing their specialty if I wasn't interested. And certainly by the time I got to my clinical rotations, I knew I wanted to do OBGYN and reproductive endocrine and infertility. So I didn't bamboozle people. I think one of the worst things you can do is tell a preceptor that you want to go into their field, you want a letter from them, even though you know differently and you've probably already told others. And then they're maybe out having dinner with a friend who's also a preceptor from another specialty. And that person says, oh no, Chase? Absolutely not. Chase is going into surgery. And maybe there's a third person there and the third person says, Chase? Oh no, Chase is going to be a neurologist. <laughs> because that's, <laughs> that's what's happening there. They're starting to see that you're playing a game. Some of them will be okay with it because they understand that's what some students do. They schmooze, but others take offense. Yeah. And I guess that's a hard line to walk if you're not really dead set on one thing, or maybe you don't have the best scores or the best letters and you know, you have to apply to a couple of different specialties. Like how do you walk that line? Again, just be honest. So certainly what you can also do is like what I did and what I recommend is on each, every time you're on a rotation, if you're getting an enthusiastic and overwhelming positive word from a doctor there, ask for a recommendation right then and there. You may not know what you're going to do, but have them write one. And I'll tell you why this is important then and there. So they write you one, they send it, right? But every doctor who writes a letter, they keep a copy of it. So maybe a year later, you finally realized you really like that particular specialty. And now you want to apply to that specialty. You can go back to that person who previously wrote you that enthusiastic general letter and ask them if they can take that letter and modify it such that now it's more specific to the specialty. The information is already written. They will remember why it was they loved you because they can pull up their letter from before. And now they can tailor it to the circumstance, whether it be your rotation, perhaps you're applying for a scholarship, they can tailor it to the scholarship because the information about you is already documented. So it's easier to jog their memory. I recommend doing that over waiting a whole year and then going back to Dr. X or Y and trying to remind them why they liked you back when you were on the rotation. They may confuse you with the other three, four, five amazing students that followed after you. Yeah, they probably had many students and, and obviously many patients in the meantime, and the information's going to get mudded. And, you know, we don't have the best memories as it is. So. And so it's not really their fault that they don't remember. It's just time has gone by. So perhaps, you know, and people say, well, then do a sub internship, a sub I. That's true. But what if that person isn't available? Perhaps they're on sabbatical. If it's a, they're a parent, maybe they're a new parent, they're on maternity or paternity leave, they may not be there when you come back. And so I'm a huge proponent for asking for letters of recommendations when that moment presents itself. If you're sitting there and they're telling you, oh my goodness, you're going to be so great at this. Oh, I really love what you did today. I just enjoyed having you on this rotation. That's your in. That's actually the physician that attending is opening the door for you to 
ask them for a recommendation. Yeah, and I also have to take in the time consideration that uh, most of my experience and most of my classmates was it can take many months to get in touch with a busy preceptor and have them actually write something and send it to you or send it into the ERAS system. So definitely doing everything you can ahead of time in preparation is going to be best practice. Absolutely. And uh, in my experience, I can't speak for every preceptor, but I know if someone indicates that to me, then I try to make notes, even if it's not a letter that they're asking for but they indicate that they enjoyed it. I try to make notes so that when their name comes up again, I have a very clear memory of who this is and how I would like to make my letter about them individualized and how I can make them shine, make them sound like a star, the star that they are. Awesome. I think that's great advice for any preceptors that might potentially be listening to this now or in the future as well. So as we get closer to the end here, there's a personal question I like to ask, and you can pick either one of these or both if you feel comfortable. And that is either the first one, is there anything you would have done differently in your educational career? Or if there's one dream that you would like to see happen in medicine during your lifetime, what would it be? Well, I guess I'll go with number two, because I can't quite think of anything I would do differently. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. Hubris speaking, it's really... Um, I spent a lot of time being very intentional about the steps during medical school. If I had to do anything differently, it actually would tie in with my next answer, which is the question two, which is where do I want to see medicine going? And that is, I would love to see more of the business of medicine taught to us, the future physicians. And when I say that, I don't mean not teaching us everything else we're being taught. But I think we need to have some basic understanding of how medicine is administrated in our world, whether it's in private practice, academic practice, in industry, there's a certain level of business associated with it that we need to know uh, the basics of a contract, the basics of compensation, the basics of reimbursement, the basics of how value is added to services. I think more physicians need to be trained that way and trained on how to value our own worth and effort. And I say this by also highlighting that other professional schools do it. We, because we're very altruistic as we should be, we are afraid to meld medicine with business, yet as soon as you're done training, it's all business. Whether you're in academia, whether you're in research writing grants, grant writing is a business. <laughs> right? True. Um, whether you go into industry, it's a business. And so you need to understand the basics of the business. And um, I feel like that was not taught. So that's probably what I would say was my regret. And I think If you talk to most seasoned people, they'll say that that's a regret that they at least encounter at some point later on. Agreed. And we have a lot of community and private practice physicians that have either been on the show or have expressed their similar views through social media. And a lot of doctors don't want to work on that personal branding because it feels like it muddies the medicine if we mix business and healthcare. But it's mandatory in this day and age, especially in certain professions more than others. And even a lot of physicians being afraid of social media and and completely eliminating themselves from it. Limiting themselves from a lot of the conversations, yet we are the most direct influencers for those conversations and should weigh in. I, in my day-to-day work now on a daily basis, I'm encountering patients coming to me with information they came across on social media. And we need to be aware, but we also need to be putting the correct information out there. We need to engage in the conversations and share because we're still very trustworthy people. Physicians are highly regarded. We're trustworthy But those watching don't know this until we share that. They won't know. Exactly. One more question for potential students is what resources might you recommend? And I guess since we're doing a last minute business thing here too, would it be a business or would it be for an endocrinology, infertility, any highly regarded or preferred resources that you would recommend for them? I regard a lot of things highly. 
But I would say there are a couple, um, there's one that you don't necessarily have to follow now, but I would say as you're preparing to go transition from being a student to being either a trainee, fellow, and attending, at those trans, trans, um, transitionary points, it would make sense to listen to a couple of the podcasts that are out there regarding finances. And so one of them is by Doc Green, uh, which is about financial independence. I'm not familiar with Doc Green. I know, obviously, like the white convention. 